Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. As usual, I am your host Kaivalya Apte, also known as KV. We software developers write a lot of code, uh, but we also read a lot of code and we also care about the code that we write. And we care about performance, readability, reusability and uh, maintainability and all the abilities that we really aim for. And to help with all those there are certain rules and principles that we tend to follow, right? And uh, if you're a software engineer and you are focused on to all these principles, you have definitely heard about Robert Martin, also known as Uncle Bob. And so I thought maybe to just clarify my doubts and to bring more clarity to my understanding and as well as my viewers understanding, I'll just invite him and talk to him about clean code, clean architecture and all the amazing books that he has written. So I'm, I'm talking about these kind of books. And you might have read this book or at least read the summary of this book, right? Like many people have written summaries and many people have understood it up to the best clarity. Many people have misunderstood it. Many people have taken it to the really extremes. So we are going to talk about that and try to make sense out of all these principles in most pragmatic way. So with this, welcome Uncle Bob. I'm really excited to have you here. Thanks a lot for joining. Sure. And I don't want to really ask you to introduce yourself because I'm pretty sure all my viewers already know about you, know a lot about you and your work. But still, let's start with a little bit of introduction and what you have been doing these days. Um, let's see. My name is Bob Martin. Uh, I've been a programmer for uh, over half a century. <laughs> I started when I was like 16, actually started when I was 12. But I, my first programming job was at 16. Uh, and I'm 71 now, so yeah, what is that? That's, what, 55 years, something like that, uh, that I have been writing code virtually uh, continuously. <laughs> lots and lots of code from the very beginnings of machines that you would today find impossible to conceive of because they're so horribly primitive to, like, the one here behind me, that little PDP-8 model, which happens to have a Raspberry Pi in it. Um, at two modern machines and modern languages and web stuff. I, I've done an awful lot of stuff over the years, tons and tons of different systems. Uh, I am writing a book at the moment, uh, although this is a very different kind of book. The, the last book I wrote was called Functional Design, and that is a book where I talk about uh, functional languages and design principles and design patterns and how you wrap all these different paradigms together uh, and make sense out of them all. And the book I'm writing now is a very different kind of book. Uh, the working title is I Programmer, and the topic is starting with George ba or starting with Charles Babbage and then working forward through programmers through the 1940s and the 1950s and, and the 60s and the 70s, and just telling the stories of these really remarkable people and the machines they had to deal with and the problems they had, both personal and technical. Uh, and, it, and it's just a lot of fun for me. I'm tying all this together and and uh, working it through right now. So I'm going to have fun with that book. <laughs> sounds sounds very interesting. I mean, I love stories and looking forward to that book. Um, to start with, right, like I believe that uh, the principles that we follow, right, they evolve with time, with uh, changing times, changing patterns. Um, even the hardware has changed so much. The processes that people follow have changed so much. So I want to start with asking you, let's say, so the clean code book that you have written, right? It's in 2008, uh, if I, if my research is correct. Uh, and I've read that book. I mean, not page to page. I, I don't read any book page to page, but I focus on bits and pieces, which I'm interested in. I go really deep into it. And then uh, I end up reading, let's say 75, 80% of the book. So I have to ask you, if you have to write clean code book again in 2024, what are the things that you will remove from the book? What are the things that you would add? And what are the things that you would add more clarity? Ah, what an interesting question. Um, so first, let me just challenge the premise of the question. Have things changed a lot? 
Now, um, the hardware's changed an awful lot since, well, since that little machine back there. <laughs> yeah, PDP-8. Right. The hardware's changed an awful lot. By the way, that little model that you see back there is about one-tenth the normal size. A, a PDP-8 would have been the size of a modern refrigerator, and it would have had 4K of core. <laughs> <laughs> it was a monster machine. Yeah. Um, the hardware has changed a lot. The hardware has changed so much that it's hard to imagine how much it has changed. But it is not difficult to construct a, a reasoning that shows that our hardware has improved by 20 or 30 orders of magnitude. Just in, in speed and in speed capacity and in power consumption and cost. And if you multiply all those together, you get really big numbers. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. astounding. And I've lived through all that. I lived through that entire past. So, so I have lived through several dozen orders of magnitude in the change of the hardware. Now, has the software changed much? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Not an awful lot. I mean, some. I mean, I was doing this little machine back here in assembly language. Okay, that's a little different from what I'm programming in now, which is Clojure. Although Clojure is really just a kind of lisp that was invented in 1957. So, so it's not that modern a language, but still, there's a, a considerable difference between the language I'm using now and the language I'm using then. But it's not 30 orders of magnitude. It's a relatively small change. And if you look at the way languages have shifted and the way applications have shifted over the decades, what you realize is that although the amount of code we write and the number of applications that we apply that code to has grown enormously, the code itself hasn't changed that much. I mean, it is still sequence selection and iteration, and we just string a lot of those sequences and selections and iterations together into a fairly large applications. So I'm going to challenge you right at the start of the premise of the question. Have things changed enough for me to look at that clean code book and rewrite it in any significant sense? And the answer to that is no. No, I, I wouldn't change a lot of the recommendations that are in the book. Are there clarifications I could make? Yes, there are clarifications. If I were to write that book now, I would write it slightly differently. There are th certain things I would emphasize a little bit differently. I told that story in Clean Code from the point of view of Java, primarily. And Java, C Sharp, C++, those kinds of languages. Um, and nowadays, especially with our new emphasis on functional programming, which I wonder if that emphasis isn't beginning to wane. But anyway, with our emphasis on functional programming nowadays, would I have phrased some of the things a little differently? Probably, but not at the level of a core change. So I think I would project it into the future with a few minor edits which I am not going to make, by the way. I don't usually do second editions. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I kind of agree that uh, if we talk about the orders of magnitude, definitely it's not comparable to how hardwares have changed. Uh, but the point I was trying to focus on is when it comes to software is how teams work together, right? Like uh, previously, uh, when I started working, it was all about monolith applications. Now there is like with advent of microservices, open source has become so huge, right? Everyone uh, is contributing to open source. If I want to do something, there are open source libraries available, right? So I'm, so modern software engineer is trying to add business value without diving too deep into writing core libraries. I mean, of course, there are people who do that, but I'm talking about like an average programmer. Uh, who is trying to consume libraries and services and trying to connect pieces together and just create business value as fast as possible. So in that sense, you, you get a lot of cloud services available or modern uh, libraries available. The new languages that are coming up, uh, I mean, new as in modern languages, let's say, uh, 
uh, they give you some new abilities to uh, go at a lower abstraction level and make some tunings and make some tweaks and all those kind of things. Uh, at least in my experience, uh, I'm mainly on JVM, Java, Scala, Kotlin, a little bit of Python, uh, very new to Go and TypeScript and all of that. But I see there are some changes, at least in the mindset of the programmer when they're writing software. They're not writing those kind of libraries. Uh, the, the software is already uh, modularized because it's very s small component that you're focusing on. I'm not uh, focusing on a huge monolith. There are so many engineers these days. Everyone responsibility is focusing on one piece of software, which is just taking data from here, doing some transformation, passing it to someone somewhere else, and then storing it in the database and something like that, doing some validations. Uh, so in that sense, uh, that, that was my focus uh, when I asked that. And I'll come back to it in a different way. I'll try to rephrase uh, to see how you would think in when it comes to this modern microservices development and you know, <laughs> how people uh, test things and all of that. Um, so you want to add something to that? So let me um, let me go back in time a little bit. Uh, Grace Hopper, Grace Hopper in 1946 uh, is in the Navy and she gets assigned to work on the Harvard Mark One. The Harvard Mark One is a gigantic machine. It's the size of a couple of railroad locomotives. It's driven by a great big electric motor that spins at 400 RPM. <laughs> It's got relays and gears and, and registers. It's a massive calculating machine. It does not have a conditional jump statement, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it can add, it can subtract, it can multiply, it can divide, and it's got a whole bunch of registers in which are gears and levers, which uh, store uh, decimal numbers 23 digits long. And her job is to program that on paper tape. There was a paper tape reader and it would read the instructions that would cause the machine to fetch data from the registers, put it into the multiplier, multiply the numbers, take the numbers out, put them back into registers and do other kinds of manipulations. Over the months and years, what she realized as she would write these programs that would, by the way, execute for two weeks straight, um, what she realized is that from program to program, there were bits of code that were similar. They weren't perfectly similar, but they were similar. And so what she would do is she would take that code and write it down by hand and then put it in a notebook. And then later on, when she had to write a new program, she would realize, oh, I've done this before. And she would go to that notebook and she would copy that code in. She called that a subroutine. Now, eventually, she would punch those subroutines on paper tape and then leave them in a paper tape library that she could then later on pull down and copy into her current paper tape as a way to uh, generate software with uh, uh, subroutines in it. From that tiny little beginning, you have the idea of compositional software, software that is composed of the work done by other people. And this just grew and grew over the years until now. I mean, you're a software developer and, and the majority of what you're doing is looking around at libraries for somebody who has already solved the problem that you are facing so that you can glue it all together, right? <laughs> so that was the first thing that you mentioned about this, right, was that well, things have really changed a lot because now we search through libraries and try and find. Now they haven't changed at all. That's what we've been doing for the last 50 years. Okay. We, we've always been doing that. I remember here. I'll, let me show you something. <laughs> I got this book in 1983 inside Macintosh, right? I had never, ever seen any book this size whose sole purpose was to describe a function library for controlling the inside of a computer. This was the most mammoth description of internal software sitting on a little machine. You can't see it up here. Well, let me go get it. 
Oh my goodness. Ah. This is my 128K oh, wow. Mac, <laughs> which eventually I upgraded to a megabyte. It doesn't work anymore. If I power it on, it just kind of goes. <laughs> but, but that book that I, I pulled down off the shelf described the software in read-only memory inside this machine and in the operating system as well. Uh, that was just remarkable. And that was like 1983. We have been in the mode of gluing together library stuff for a very long time. So that is not new. There is nothing new about it. I mean, it's very old. Now, the other thing you mentioned was microservices. Let me talk about that. I gotta put my Macintosh back. Try to drop it. There we go. <laughs> I wish I could show you. I've got a whole bunch of old computers sitting up there. <laughs> so um, the compiler, the Fortran compiler for the 1403 machine, this is early IBM, one of the first transistor computers made by IBM. Um, the compiler, they had this problem, right? How do you compile when you've only got 4K of, of memory? And by the way, in, um, in a 1401, that was a decimal machine. So that was not 4096 words of memory. It was 4,000 words of memory in decimal. Anyway, how do you do that? <clears throat> and the way they did it is they would, uh, they would read the entire source code into memory. And the very first little bit of code they would execute on that would get rid of all the spaces. Fortran was a language that had no spaces. It completely ignored spaces for this reason so that you could compress the source code down to a string without any spaces in it. <laughs> so that was their first little thing. And that little job ran in a deck of cards that would re be read in binary. So there was this big stack of cards in the card reader. You'd read that little thing in there, it would read it in into 700 bytes, if I remember correctly. And then it would execute that and get rid of all the spaces. Then it would read the next little batch of cards in, and that was a little program that would take the source code now in memory, and it would start to tokenize it. And then it would read in the next little batch, and it would compress it even more, and it would read in the next little batch, and it would compress it even more. And each of these little micro routines would come in, and would operate over whatever the output of the previous one was, and it would shrink it even more. And if I remember correctly, they had like 70 of these little routines. They called them overlays, little routines, that would progressively pass through the source code, slowly turning it into binary. And the last of the little card things, little overlays coming in, would simply punch that binary deck. Now that is a fairly adequate description of microservices, although not being not sitting on a network and communicating, but communicating through uh, memory and getting read in by uh, by a card reader. We used to do this kind of stuff all the time because we had memory constraints, right? So we'd read code in and execute it and then put something in memory and then we'd read the next code in and operate over it and put it away in memory. We used to do this kind of thing all the time. The idea behind microservices is not a new idea. The whole idea behind service-oriented architecture is not a new idea. These are old ideas that have resurfaced because there's a new environment to run them in. But that's the same idea, right? We're going to take the, the software and break it up into a whole bunch of little things that can collaborate in an interesting way. Old ideas, old techniques, 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 now have a slightly modern twist because of the hardware that we're sitting That is refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, refreshing to know that things haven't changed. Uh, so what I'm doing is kind of an old method. I'm just kind of rebranded it. <laughs> slightly different. You're slightly probably different. using REST or something like that. So yeah. an encoding scheme. But, and that's just an encoding scheme, right? The yeah. big problem... If you're going to do microservices, the big problem is how do you separate it? How do you yeah. identify the functions? How do you separate it? How do you minimize the, com the communications overhead? Because yeah. all the overhead is in the communications when you're talking about services like that, right? So Absolutely. how do you do all that? And one of the things that's interesting about that is that 
people think they're getting a benefit merely from the separation. Oh, if I turn it into a bunch of services, then I can work on these services in isolation. What? You could work on the little bits of code in isolation anyway. They don't have to be services. You don't have to squeeze a whole bunch of data down a serial line in order to communicate between two components. You can organize your software into components that are very nicely separated and then at a much later time decide that, well, maybe some of these components should be somewhere else on the network. That is a far better way to think about services than to start with the idea that, oh, we got to break it up into services and we're going to have services over here and services over there and life's going to be beautiful. And then you find out that life is not beautiful at all because <laughs> the startup scenario is just terrible. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's so true. I mean, uh, <laughs> people forget the core problem uh, that certain way or certain technologies are born to solve. And they think that, okay, microservices are ideal now and monoliths are old. Who works on monoliths, right? Even if the monolith is the actual piece of software that is actually making money for you. And they are trying to move away from microservices thinking that microservices will be great. Of course, there are new hundreds of new problems that you have to deal with uh, that no one really cares about. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. Like people think that cert following certain patterns will solve all their problems without actually thinking about it, right? And uh, so we talked about at the service level, like how different components interact. Uh, we'll go deep into the code level where we talk about different classes and functions. And because again, this is the organization where it, it all starts, right? This structure, if you get it right, you can kind of apply those patterns at a high level, even at the higher level, right? Uh, at the component level, for example. Um, so I want to talk about all those ideas. So let, let's start with very basic here, like... I've seen people going really extreme. So when it comes about following certain principles, people either go this way or that way. There is no middle way where people find middle ground, like a good balance. So starting with naming a variable, right? Either people would name it ITR, IDX, like really acronyms of some things, or they will go like uh, user ID based on certain, and it's like a whole sentence people are writing in a variable name or a function name. And these are all both extremes. So what is your suggestion? Like people take it in an extreme way when you say that, okay, have descriptive names, right? Don't add misinformation when it comes to functions and variables. So how to get that balance? People have got it all wrong. So the balance that I like to strike is based on the size of the scope. So variables. Uh, if I've got a, a loop and the body of that for loop is one line long, then the even the even mixing in that for long. <laughs> I don't I don't want to see some long name in there. I want to see I. I don't want to see anything of just I because if there's only one line in the for loop, I pretty much know what that variable is. Now, on the other hand, if I've got um, several nested for loops and a body of code that's fifty lines long, well, then I don't want to see a bunch of I's and J's anymore because I'm going to lose track of that. So I'm going to need slightly longer names. And, and that is the, the fundamental rule that I like to follow. The longer the scope that a variable lives in, the longer the name should be. So uh, inside of a very small loop, one letter is fine. Uh, the uh, member variables of a class, well, class is a fairly large scope. So I would expect the member variables to have a, a proportionately long name. A word, maybe two words, right? The arguments of a function. Well, they just live within the function. So that's a fairly small scope. Uh, a word, even an abbreviation would work for me if it's a small function. A single letter might work for me if it's a very small function. A global variable, which by the way, there are global variables in the world. I know we, we like to say that there's no such thing, but there is, we have to have them. Uh, and uh, global variables need good long names. I don't want a global variable named I. That would be bad. I want a global variable with a nice long name. So that's one of the ways that I mitigate the rules, right? It's easy to say, well, you should use descriptive names. Well, yeah, but in context, I is a very descriptive name. <laughs> 
So yeah, all of yeah. this stuff is engineering, right? It's all trade-offs, right? Everything is context dependent. And it's very difficult to communicate that in a book or even in a lecture um, where you say things in a book or a lecture that you say, well, your name should be descriptive. You should focus on descriptive names. And you never get to quite say that, but I can be descriptive in a context. <laughs> Now, I think I do say that in the clean code book. I think it's in there somewhere. I think I just, I think I quoted that rule in the clean code book. I hope I did. Can't remember. I totally agree. Right? It depends on the context and uh, you cannot just follow oh. one rule for everything because there is context and that's the software engineering part all about, right? It's yeah. not just about writing code uh, that, that will just run, but it's about writing code that others would understand and you can play with it, can without pain, can read the code and change it or extend it. So that's what your book talks about as well. So I totally agree. So there needs to be a balance. And that's a good pointer. Like look at the scope of a variable. And if it makes sense to be descriptive, go ahead and be descriptive. But naming is hard, right? Like uh, getting a name to anything, like starting from a variable to a service, it's so hard, even for products. So once I worked with a service, it was named George <laughs> Twinney. <laughs> I had no clue. I had yeah. no clue what that service was supposed to do. Uh, but yeah, people take it to extremes. What can we do? The other uh, variation or like slightly higher level of uh, component is a function, right? Like you talk about function, about the size of a function. Again, naming is again a big part. And I guess it has. So you, if you follow like small functions uh, approach, you tend to give smaller and meaningful function names as well. So it has a cascading effect. If you have, if you are doing like hundreds of things in a function, you cannot give a good name to a function. That's what I think. And maybe you can correct me. Um, talking about the length of the functions, uh, you mentioned that you should have like very small functions and the function should do one thing, do it really well. And again, that, that is, it has, you have to read between the lines. There's a nuance to it. When you say one thing and your book clearly mentions, like, how do I figure out that one thing? And it talks about the level of abstraction, right? So give us your thought, like, uh, when we talk about level of abstraction, what are we talking about? And what happens if I have two abstraction levels in one function? Let's say, instead of writing two small functions of two, three lines each, if I have six uh, line function, uh, what what is going to be wrong in that? Well, wrong is probably the not the right way to say that. <laughs> um, so so let's talk about that. I like small functions. Um, I like to take my functions and break them up into smaller and smaller ones until I cannot break them up anymore. And I measure that by using the extract method refactoring. So most IDEs nowadays have this operation that allows you to select code with a mouse and, yeah. and pull out a new function. Well, I will do that until I can't do it anymore meaningfully. Uh, and that's how I define one thing. If a function has code that can be extracted, it must be doing more than one thing. If I want my functions to do one thing, I have to extract them until there's nothing more to extract. That's also how I define um, the abstraction layers of functions. So a function that does two extractable things lives at a higher level of abstraction than the little functions down at the bottom that only have uh, zero extractable things, right? So that's how I would define that. And then I will create this nice little hierarchy of functions. And what I find when I do that is that the names of the functions get longer and longer as I descend down that abstraction level. As I extract and extract, the names of the functions get longer and longer because the operation of the functions becomes more and more precise. Everything above that becomes more abstract. Like Those functions don't actually know what they're doing. They're just delegating downwards. And so they have shorter and shorter names. So my rule for names of functions is the opposite of my variable name rule, which is the shorter the scope, the longer the function name. The bigger the scope, the shorter the function name. And then I follow that rule down. Now, 
That's the way I define it in the clean code book. That is the way I operate, especially in languages like Java and C Sharp and C and C++. I break things down into lots of tiny little functions. Is that right? There's a whole bunch of reasons why at the bottom level, you really don't want all those little tiny functions. There's, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you'd like to pop the bubbles and put some of them together. So um, at the bottom level, I might break them all apart. And then I'll look at them and go, mm, nah, those two should be together. <laughs> I'll pop the bubbles down at the bottom layer and may, maybe make it a little bit more reasonable. As I have been working in Clojure, I find that the language Clojure forces me in just because the way the language is structured forces me into grouping those last levels of functions together without being able to extract them. It's just the way the language works. Extracting those last little functions turns out to be very difficult. And so I wind up with a nice extraction layer, a nice abstraction hierarchy from the top level down until I get close to the bottom. And then it's like I've merged a bunch of little functions together. And I'm still puzzling this one out. I'm trying to figure out, is there some feature I could add to the language that would make this easier to tease those last little bits out? Or is there even a need to? Because in the end, it's just those last layer of functions that you know, people can generally read just fine. So the word right doesn't quite fit this scheme. But the technique is a very valuable technique. The last thing we want is a 3,000 line function up at the top that does everything. <laughs> we want to learn how to break things apart into manageable chunks. And most people do not take that far enough. Now, maybe you don't take it all the way down, but most people don't take mm. it far enough. Most people leave their functions too large. And there's a problem with that. There's a whole bunch of problems with that. But one of the bigger problems with that is that a function that is large has a bunch of variables in it and a bunch of indents in it. And if you think carefully about that, you'll realize that's a class. If you're doing an object-oriented program, right, a bunch of variables with a bunch of indents really turns into a bunch of fields and a bunch of methods. There's a class hiding in there, and you'd like to get that class out. So that's kind of where I draw the line. If you're going to leave a class sitting in a function, you're doing something probably wrong. There I will use the word wrong. <laughs> if you've got a few private methods down there at the bottom and you just don't feel like extracting the last layer, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Hmm. Th that, that makes sense. And again, it's contextual, right? Uh, there is an approach, like nothing right or wrong. There's an approach that you could use to break down your functions into small little functions that are easier to maintain, easier to understand, and more importantly, easier to test, right? Because writing a test on a two or three line function, it's way easier. We'll, we'll come back to <laughs> testing. I have some more questions there. Uh, but I think I, I agree that up to a certain limit, you know, creating smaller functions really help. Uh, and there are two dimensions I look at it, removing or kind of kind of aggregating those side effects that each function creates into their own places where they should exist and not having like side effects sprinkled all over your code base, like right from the line one to line 10. So, and then the other problem I've seen, so once I saw an example where someone just for splitting the function to a smaller function, they split the, there was a switch case. They just split the switch case and had like a couple of uh, switch statements or cases in one function and a couple of them <laughs> in the other function. And it didn't make any sense to me, right? Like, like I, I, am, I have to now jump across multiple functions just to understand what is this class doing just, or just function to doing. There for a minute. And just to show you how things stay the same as much as they change. In the very early days of programming, this concept of modular programming came out. Prior to that, we just stuck all of our source code into one great big thing. It wasn't even a file, right? It was a massive deck of cards because we didn't have files in those days, right? So our program would be one great big deck of cards. And then at some point, somebody said, well, we should do modular programming. And in modular programming, you're going to have one module and another module. Huh? We'll break it up into modules, and then we can assemble our programs from these modules. And uh, because of that, 
somebody else came along and said, well, no module should be longer than 500 bytes because in those days we measured the size of our code in the size of the binary, right? So, oh, no module should be larger than 500 bytes. And so in the end, programmers would write a 499 byte module and then put a jump instruction in it to jump to the next module, <laughs> which is exactly what your switch statement guy did. <laughs> Things, yes. you know, the more things change, the more and, they stay the same. And <laughs> absolutely. And that's a great point. Thanks for adding that example or analogy. Um, and then they would kind of also argue that what function should be small. If I add the other two cases in the switch statement, it will grow to, let's ah. say, six lines. But Uncle Bob says it has to be two lines. <laughs> so people start quoting you. Um, and uh, talk about clean code and without understanding the, the core problem you're trying to solve, right? Like you're creating new problems here and not solving them. Uh, maybe you're solving them on the surface because you now have two functions that you can test them, but it's not, yeah. it's creating yeah, yeah. new problems. Don't split your switch um, statement like that. Now, now whether you <laughs> have switch statements yeah. is another matter. <laughs> but, but, that is going to be my <laughs> <the> next question. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Don't do that. Yes. Um, that makes sense. Right. And uh, sometimes, so this is just my feeling. I don't know right, wrong, or some rules. Probably there are some rules broken. But when you have, let's say, a switch statement, uh, I agree you are kind of, you recommend uh, ha having no s uh, switch statements or having yeah. FISM to solve them. Uh, but sometimes it's it feels like it, there's some boilerplate going on, right? If I can have like a small procedure or a function here, where I say, okay, switch statement and cases, and then some functions also give me like compile time errors if I miss on some of the case, which is quite yeah. nice, right? And uh, that might not be possible with if I break down into different classes and polymorphic uh, classes. Uh, so that, and it, the other feeling I have sometimes is when I have one uh, function at one place where there is a lot of conditional logic, sometimes it's easier to understand what is happening. Well, it's like an algorithm, right? But if I have to jump across multiple types to see what each of the implementations might be doing, it might become hard. So how do we find that balance? Well, there? look, I mean, if you've got three switch statements, I'm not going to worry about three switch statements. If you've got, if you've got three switch statements and, that, and they have 10 cases each, I'm not going to worry about that. That's not the problem we're trying to solve. The problem we're trying to solve is when you've got a million lines of code. And that switch statement that you've written has replicated itself 50 times throughout the body of that code, all with the same cases, right? It's just that it appears over here, it appears over here, it appears over here. And all of a sudden, you're going to add a new case. And when you add a new case, you've got to find mm -hmm. all 50 of them. And you've got to modify all 50. But then, of course, there are those programmers who don't use switch statements. They use if-else chains. So you've got to find yes. the if-else chains, and you've got to decode the logic that they used in the if-else chains. And it turns into a nightmare, and you're going to miss some, and it's just bad. So in that case, it is far better to take those switch statements and to make them polymorphic. But this is not a golden rule. This is not one of those things that, oh, yes, all switch statements must be turned into polymorphism. As it turns out, that's only beneficial if you add, it, it is easier to add more data types than more functions. If the number of functions you have is pretty stable, but the number of data types is going to grow on you, well, then polymorphism is much better than switch statements. On the other hand, <laughs> if the number of data types that you have is very stable, but the number of operations is going to grow, well, then switch statements solve the problem. Because if you have a big inheritance hierarchy, then the hierarchy never changes. Right? There's no new data types, but you're always adding new operations to it. You've got to find every place where you've got to add all those operations, and you're going to have the same problem that you had with the switch statements in the alternate case. So these two um, structures, switch statements and polymorphic hierarchies, are 90 degrees rotated from each other. They are reflections of the control structure. The control structure is identical, right? They do the same thing. 
It's just that one is rotated 90 degrees from the source code point of view. In one, we gather together the data types and separate the functions. In the other, we gather together the functions and separate the data types. There's no right answer there. It all depends on which one is going to change more frequently. And if you're an architect, you will often set up your data structures so that one changes more frequently than the other. The data types change more frequently or operations change more frequently. And I actually, rep I actually talk about this in the Clean Code book. There's a whole chapter on that <laughs> and how you make that decision and what you're going to do to try and separate this. If you are of the object-oriented mindset, then generally speaking, you tend to group operations and separate data structures. And you wind up with inheritance hierarchies that are very pleasant to modify when you add new data types. And they're hell to modify when you add new operations. <laughs> that, that does make sense. And um, it seems like there is also some sort of dry principle coming along because you're repeating yourself yeah. multiple times and you don't know where exactly. And when someday you want to change something or extend that thing. It's all broken because you yep. have it 50 places, right? But we'll come to the dry principle uh, separately. Um, I, I want to also focus, since we are talking about functions, right? Like having these long functions, and I've also written, I, I, I didn't have any idea that long functions could be a problem unless I faced the problem, right? And uh, what you would do is, so there's like a procedure, like long procedure, which will start like a global uh, variable that is supposed to be set by n different things along the way. And then you will return that variable at the end, right? So no one has a clue where exactly that variable would be changed. And I think the core problem is because the variable is mutable. And immutability these days, uh, immutability is these days is pretty common, right? Like people uh, ask you to write immutable uh, variables and use those. And uh, there, there's like a separate class of mutable collections as well and immutable collections. So immutability yes. is a big deal these days. And I think it's a good thing. Um, and when you have larger functions, there is a, there's a, you want to have that mutable variable and just to change it and do it right there instead of passing in immutable variables and having smaller functions. So there's some level of laziness coming from that. So uh, what are your thoughts on immutability? of when it comes to these variables. So this is getting into the area of functional programming, right? Functional programming is programming with immutability, right? You, you don't use assignment statements in a functional language, usually, right? And uh, the benefits are kind of obvious. Once you think about it, um, all, I shouldn't say this because it's not quite true, uh, almost all race conditions occur because of mutable variables. So if you have multiple concurrent threads running and you have mutable variables that those threads modify, it's difficult, yeah. right? You've got to figure out all the possible race conditions and concurrent update issues. And you need transactions and rollbacks and commits and stuff like that to try and help you maintain some kind of order. If you don't have mutable variables, well, that problem goes away to a large degree. Not perfectly there are still cases where you can have race conditions. I talk about that in, in my book, Functional Design, but it vastly mitigates that problem and makes it much easier to write um, threads that collaborate. Okay, so that's one. Generally speaking, it's also just easier to understand a module and it's easier to debug a module and, and figure out what a module is doing if it doesn't make changes to variables. Because if it makes changes to variables, then you've got to keep track of those variables. And what's the state of this variable right now? And what is the state later? If you've got a, a, a nice functional decomposition, then you're feeding that data from one function to the, to the next, and it's very easy to trace it all through. So I like, nowadays, I like to use functional languages because it makes my code a lot simpler a lot easier to deal with in that regard. <laughs> and it means that I can also have a certain amount of safety in terms of threads. So generally speaking, I like the functional mindset. It's a good idea 
mutability is something that we should be, we should treat mutability as a necessary evil and mitigate it wherever we can, but you can't do it everywhere. <laughs> okay. But it's yeah. a good idea. Absolutely. Fine. I like it. Awesome. Uh, I want to take an example uh, just to give it a more, give it the function discussion a bit more shape. Uh, so let's say I, I've seen this many times because I've been working in e-commerce and uh, some uh, communications API uh, companies as well. So there is, let's say, a send email function, right? And send email takes in, let's say, an email address or some other information and then gives you like a, a promise or a future that, oh, this email was sent because there's network involved. And it has a bunch of steps. So first you will, of course, validate the email address and then uh, let's say I'm, I'm saying there's all one function. There are no sub functions. And I want to do this thought exercise with you to how you would bring in those level of abstractions and kind of split those functions. That would make sense. So let's say I do the validation of email. And then once the validation is done, I'll check, let's say, item potency, right? If this email was already sent or not. So I do that kind of check. And then I... I uh, figure out what is the best gateway to use to send this kind of email. Let's say if it's a marketing email or like a one-to-one -one email or something like that. And then I send an email, right? And once I send an email, I have to return that promise back that like, okay, it was sent. And that will have an ID using which you can do some post send analytics that, oh, this was sent, it was opened, uh, some links were clicked and whatnot, right? So there's a bunch of things happening. I have it in one function. And then uh, for item potency, it might be using some database to check if it was already sent or not, and there are failures. So it will also have some try catch blocks and the function grows up to let's say 15, 20 lines. So when I have to, let's say I have to refactor this function, uh, reading the clean code book, understanding those principles and playing with those level of abstraction that one function should do one thing when it comes to the abstraction level, how would you suggest we think about this, uh, splitting this function? So as you were speaking, I was trying to assemble this in my mind. How would I deal with this? And I would I'm probably get, yeah. I'm just kind of going off the fly here, but that probably create some kind of um, data structure. I'd use, in closure, I'd use a map. Right? And in this map, I would be able to put certain keys. And keys would be things like the email message, and the gateway, and whether it's been validated or not, and a few other things um, that, that correspond to the processing level that we have put this email through. And then I could construct a chain of functions. And the chain of functions is pretty obvious once you have that data structure, right? So the email message comes in, it goes through the validation function, the validation function creates the context and says, yes, it's valid, or no, it's not valid. And then the next line says, well, okay, has this already been sent? And this is the one that checks the database. And it puts something in that data structure that says, yes, it's been sent or no, it hasn't been sent. And if it's been sent, here's where it was sent and so on. And then we go to the next one and we say, okay, let's pick the right gateway. And that function takes that data structure in and adds the, um, the gateway to it. And in each of these functions, this data structure is going in and a new one is coming out. It's a copy of the old one with the new data in it. So we've got immutability, right? Just threading these variables through these functions. And in the end, we go to the send function, which returns a promise, which is also stuck into that context. So now we've got this email context with the promise sitting there. And then the next function is sitting on the promise, pulling it out because the thread will come back to it, right? And doing the post analysis on it. Now that's one function and we've got the whole thread put together. If that's five or six steps long, that's pretty good. And each of the little functions would, would have the validate function would have its own little implementation and the item potency one would have its own little implementation and the sending would have its own little implementation. But let's say that it's a little bit more than five steps. Let's say it's 20 steps, right? You know, so maybe there's a bunch of steps yeah. in there. And you look at that and think, oh, man, yeah. it's just so long. And no one's going to want to follow this through. To, isn't there some way I can break this 
up? Isn't there some classification I can find that would find some of those steps to be in one class classification? I'm not talking about class here. I'm talking about classification and some others in another category. Yeah. And, it, and if I could, I would probably split them up into larger functions. So, so we might have the pre-sending um, uh, batch and then the sending batch and then the post-sending batch. And that would reduce the initial function down to, say, three lines, which are passing that context around. And then, of course, that context gets passed into a bunch of other functions, which thread them through. Right? So you get the pre-sending one and the sending one and the post-sending one. And, of course, those would all splay out into yet others. I don't know a better way to describe that. It, it is a dilemma that I face frequently that I wind up with a function that is large-ish because it's got a number of steps like that. And there's no obvious way to categorize the steps. So sometimes I'll just leave them. Say, okay, well, there's 11 steps. Sorry, can't do anything about that. Sometimes I can split them out and I feel a little better about that. But what can you do? Right? At some point you go, well, yep. it's 11 steps, damn it. Yeah, that that makes sense. And uh, this is how even I've seen it implemented. So instead of a map, we create, so it's like a state machine, like what is happening with yeah. this particular email? What state was it in? Uh, but the state is in memory. We can always store it in database, like what was the last step done, for example. Uh, but instead of a map, we used like an object and then you would use like a builder pattern to sort of build that object. So you have strictness when it comes to the keys that you can put in the map yep. and whatnot. So, but yeah, I, I like that approach uh, mainly because it's it's very pragmatic. It's not like, okay, there, you're following certain rules, but you're not like really, okay, even I, I only need two lines and things like that. So, because it's easier to understand so if I ask someone, what is the algorithm you use to send an email? Like, what are the steps involved? If I have one, let's say, five-line function, it, it makes sense. Uh, it, I'm able to understand. Uh, and then talking about uh, splitting it down into multiple classes, probably I'll have, let's say, an item potency checker or email sender or email gateway and whatnot, right? So then I'm talking about these functions spread across different classes as well. So sometimes... I mean, it's easier. Uh, sometimes it might be difficult depending on how complicated or the complex the logic is. But I like the separation in general. Cool. Uh, and you also covered the immutability part that you would uh, have immutable map passing along because that can be a problem when you are changing the state incorrectly, right? So that is a, uh, that is a good thing. Um, cool. Since we also said that there might be some errors while sending an email, let's talk about error handling, right? Like uh, your book talks about a lot of concepts when it comes to error handling. Those are, it feels like common sense, but it's not <laughs> that common, right? Like, oh, you have to use descriptive error messages. But even myself, I have written log messages that has no ID in it, nothing. And when you try to debug, you have no pointer. It's just something bad happened, something like that, like so generic. So apart from that, I want to focus on throwing exceptions versus returning an error value or an error state. So for example, in Java, I throw exceptions. Uh, in some other languages, let, there's a either type or a result type, which will, you know, either success or error. And then you can flat map error or flat map OK and talking about a functional language like Scala, for example. I know, uh, again, the answer would be it depends, uh, but I still want to ask you, what is your preferred way <laughs> Do you still say that throwing exception versus it's language specific and based on what your language supports, you have to use that pattern? So what are your thoughts oh, on boy. that? Oh, boy. Th this is one of those topics that always ends in frustration for me, right? Because there's no good solution. All the solutions are bad. And why are all the solutions bad? Well, because we're dealing with bad things. We're dealing with the stuff that shouldn't happen, but it does happen. So we've yeah. got to put this stuff that shouldn't happen into our code, which makes the code ugly. Because if we could ignore all those bad things, well, then our code would be very pretty. Now, 
one of the great things about exceptions is that in the try block of an exception, nothing bad can happen. <laughs> so that code can live in this fantasy world where no bad thing happens and you can have these little islands of pretty code that pretends like everything is great all the time. And then you have the cash blocks and the cash blocks are awful. <laughs> the cash blocks have to try and try and do something meaningful with the horrible thing that happened. And one of my rules is to make sure that the try code is completely separate from the cash blocks. I want them in different functions. So I want the body of a try block pulled out, extracted into its own function that lives in the fantasy world. And then I want another function which has the try block in it, which calls that function and then deals with all the horrible catches. And at least that way, I have separated the perfect world from the real world. Now that works in languages that have a reasonable exception processing uh, facility. C++ is not such a language. See, they threw exceptions into C++. They probably never should have because they just don't work the way you think they do. And they don't work across different libraries. It's a, it's a horror scene. In, in languages like C++, it's a horror scene. In languages like Java and C Sharp, Clojure, Python, Ruby, it's actually rather pleasant. You can, you can deal with exceptions pretty well. Uh, Go is an interesting one, because in Go, you can return multiple things from a function. You can do that in Python as well. And so the idea of returning error codes is possible. You can, you can return values and errors. So one of the standard techniques in Go is to always return two things from a function. <laughs> the value you want and the error code. While that's interesting, but it means that you're constantly checking these damned error codes. Your code is constantly doing this if statement. Well, if he is okay, if he is okay. Well, I don't like that so much either. There are no great solutions to this. It's just how good at you at separating the fantasy world from the real world and how good at you at organizing the real world so that it doesn't completely overwhelm the intent of the function, the intent of the application. And that's just hard. It's hard. Now, do we do log yep. messages? Mm, log messages. I mean, everybody wants to put log messages out because they really help debugging. But boy, do they clutter up the code. Do they make the code a mess? Are they log this and log that and we're logging this and the whole, all the code just turns into this massive set of log statements. And so one of the things yep. that I try to do there is separate out the log statements from the fantasy land code or the or even the real world code. I will separate them out using, if I can, I'll use some kind of polymorphism. So I can write my classes to not do any log messages, but they'll handle the fantasy world and they'll handle the real world. And then I will derive from those classes using inheritance or something ugly like that. I will derive from those classes and I will put the log messages in the derivatives. And the derivatives will call up to the real world or they'll call up to the fantasy world and return, and there will be log messages around that. And by doing that, I have at least separated the log messages from the nice flow of the code and the real world handling of the bad things. And it's all just a nightmare because you're separating all this stuff out and you're trying to keep it sane. And it's hard to keep that sane. Programming is hard. Uh, Dykstra said, yeah. I could have been a nuclear physicist, but I chose the harder of the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, error handling is always tricky. And I, I, I'm also dicey most of the times because I also like returning types instead of errors or throwing exceptions. But then at the end, you also have to have this catch-all types of error code where we couldn't just map it to any error code. So we just say something bad happened or unknown error, right? And it, it's as bad as, yeah. And then I, I want to talk a little bit more on the fantasy land, the, yeah. the try block, right? Uh, so in the try block as well, I still have to check for some errors, right? Like Because uh, depending on what, let's say I'm calling a library and I, I think that library might throw an exception, but I, I don't want to throw that 
exception coming from the library, I want to yep. throw a business exception. So I have to check, oh, if it's error or something like that and throw my custom exception. So it's not a, like all of fantasy land either, right? Even if we talk about tribe blocks. Well, if in your fantasy world, you call a library and that library can throw an exception, I would want to catch that out in the catch block so that my fantasy land doesn't have to deal with it. You can sometimes get away with that. Hmm. And there's sometimes you can't. And so when you can't, <laughs> then you've got another tribe block. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm going to yeah. have to have another try block and I'm going to from my fantasy world I'm going to call out to a function that has a try block so it's ugly and it will call out to get another fantasy world <clears throat> now uh, you can chain this n levels deep and at some point you throw your hands in the air and say well okay I'm just going to have to put a try block in the fantasy world because I can't keep chaining this stuff together but in normal cases yeah. you can get away with usually one try block sometimes two yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's no uh, one answer that is right, one yeah. answer that is wrong. It's, again, dependent on the context. Uh, but yeah, those, <clears throat> those insights were really helpful. Um, coming to the dry principle, right? Like, like, don't repeat yeah. yourself. Uh, people, or even myself, I've done this. Like, when I have this, so I, I have one large function. I try to split that function. I go to the bottom level. And I find myself writing some sort of utility or some sort of helper functions, right? And then I'd say, okay, let's move this helper function to a helper class or a utility class, right? And then I name my class like, okay, like something like string utils, something like email utils. And then it just, so that becomes a bag of all the functions that I yeah. that are really low level. And I, I, it's just everything in there, right? Uh, Sometimes just to make it reusable across the functionality, let's say validation of email might be required somewhere else. Uh, I do this some sort of abstraction that uh, sometimes it's well known, like validation of email. Perfect. You know that how you do that and what kind of variations you would expect. But sometimes the abstraction itself is not known. And I've seen people ending up creating early abstraction when things are not yet clear. And it's generally wrong because the other part of the abstraction is evolving differently. So don't repeat yourself. I totally agree. But it does it have like a timeline when your product is mature? Don't repeat yourself. But if you are working on a greenfield project, when things are not clear, don't try to create abstractions and it's okay to repeat yourself. What are your thoughts about the that? The first thing to realize is that every abstraction is too early for the next thing to come along. So you're going to make an abstraction and you're going to hope that abstraction protects you from the future. And maybe it protects you from one or two things in the future. And then the next thing's going to come along and, oh, I need a better abstraction. That never ends, right? So you're constantly growing. Yeah. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> Duplicate code. Um, there are two kinds. I like to say it this way. There are two kinds of duplication. There's essential duplication and there's accidental duplication. Essential duplication are the duplicates that will all change together. So if you have N of them and a change comes along, all N of them will be changed identically. And when you have that, mm. then you certainly want to get rid of that duplication. But accidental duplication is of another kind. Accidental duplication is two bits of code that look the same. But when they change in different directions, they change for different reasons, right? and you don't want to bring those together. So there's a fair bit of judgment that goes into this. And you look at these two duplications. Maybe you found it accidentally. Maybe you were in a module and you looked at some code and you thought, boy, that looks familiar. And you go over to another module and you see the same batch of code. And then you think, oh, dry principle, I should unify them. But then you think, well, wait a minute. What causes this module to change? What causes that module to change? Is that the same force? If it's the same force, then okay, maybe I can unify them. But if they're different forces, well, then maybe I should not unify them. And that's just a judgment call. And you'll do it wrong. <laughs> you will do it wrong. Yeah. But okay. All right. As long as you're careful about it and you look at it and you use some kind of judgment and think, well, all right, I'll pay the price if I did it wrong. But at least I think I've I think I've done it right. I think I have. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, mainly when you're not writing a library. <clears throat> let's say you're writing a library, you end up creating abstractions that are that is also exposed to, let's say, hundreds of users of that library. Then it becomes costly, right? Because then to change that abstraction that, oh, I messed up, I didn't see this coming. So I want to change. And then changing <laughs> hundreds of your users is painful and it's like huge migration <laughs> effort. So I guess, uh, are you suggesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you suggesting in this case, it's better to wait until you know that for sure, I mean, for sure is again, not 100%, but let's say 90%, 80% that, okay, this is going to be the same or uh, stay the same, at least for some amount of time. So do you recommend waiting there or do you still recommend the dry approach? um, I'm writing a module and this module, it's got to do a bunch of things. And the things it's got to do are roughly similar, but it's got to do them. It's got to, let's say it's got to do four of them for some reason. And they're roughly similar, a little different, but roughly similar. And I write the first one and I'm, I'm doing test driven development. So my tests are passing and I got this first one to pass all of its tests. And I think, okay, I got to do this three more times. And I copy, paste, paste, paste. And then I fiddle it into working and, and all the tests pass. And I fiddle the next one into working and the test pass. I fiddle the next one into working and the test pass. Do I leave it that way? Or should I then think, okay, these are awfully similar. They're all in the same function. They're all pursuing the same goal. Maybe I should extract out a common function, put the arguments in nicely. Okay, it's going to take me 15 minutes but it's going to vastly simplify this application and bring all of this duplicated code into a nice little function. Generally speaking, in that scenario, I would do that. I would do that. I would do that extraction. In the cases where I accidentally find two duplicated things, I'm going to be a lot more skeptical about that. You know, if Even if they're in the same class. Okay. Right. If I wrote something in a class and it, and it ended up with a utility function and somebody else wrote something in the same class months later and didn't see that utility function and they wrote their own and it does the same thing, some little private function down there. And I'm going to look at that and think, I don't know if they're going to change together because I didn't write that. And I don't know what the intent is. I'd have to look at it pretty carefully, but I might I might opt to just let them sit there. <laughs> they're not doing any harm. And they didn't come from the same chain of reasoning. Yeah. So I think I'll leave them. Interesting. Uh, cool. Since we are talking about abstractions and we have talked about a bit more about clean code, elect like functions and classes and error handling, let's talk a little bit about <laughs> the solid principles. And I think these, these principles are really <laughs> solid. I've, I've used them. And uh, <laughs> uh, But again, there is some misconceptions, right? Like when it comes to single responsibility uh, principle, People think that, okay, doing the one thing, right? How do I find the one thing? And then it's a different way of saying it. Like any class should have one reason to change. How are these two things different? Like doing one thing versus having one reason to change. It should not have been named the single responsibility principle. And I I can't take credit for naming it. And maybe it's my fault for using a name from a different principle for this principle. I'm not quite sure. But uh, the name is misleading. It is not the it is not the do one thing principle. That's a completely different idea. The single responsibility yeah. principle is about who's going to ask you for the change. The single responsibility principle is about people. Who are the people that are going to ask you to change what you are currently writing? And if you can identify more than one. <laughs> Well, you probably need to separate those two that those two different things. If there are two different people who follow different job functions and they're going to ask you to make different kinds of changes, then you probably ought to separate them. And the easiest example of that is a function that does some computation and then prints some kind of report. And the people who read that report are going to ask you for one kind of change. And the people who depend on the computation are going to ask you for another kind of change. And you probably ought to separate those two into separate classes 
so that when one of them asks you for a change, you don't break the other guy. That adds a lot of clarity. And just to give an example and validate my understanding. So let's say you're working with a product manager and someone from marketing or analytics yeah. team, right? If the product manager asks you, it's mainly about the feature of the product, right? And if someone from marketing or analytics is asking you, it's about the side or the non-functional aspects of your product. Like I want to do analytics on how how many orders this customer plays and how many clicks are they making and all of that. So these are two separate concerns and they should live in separate yes. classes or entities. Yeah, I think is that's that clear? Very clear. It's or separation is... of concerns because way back then, okay. David Parnas, right? Okay. Separate concerns, put them in different modules. Identify what those concerns are because they come from different people. So talking about other principles, I see confusion or rather some concerns on the dependency inversion, right? Like you should depend on interfaces or rather abstractions and not core implementations, right? That's the idea. Uh, people, when I have, when I write some new functionality, right? Like this gives me the idea of creating some abstraction or just an interface. Even if there is just one implementation, even if there is always going to be one implementation, I'm not writing like a payment gateway, which might have 10 different implementations or a tax calculation class, which might have 10 different implementations. Let's say I'm talking about a general utility class or something like that. Do I still need to depend on the abstraction or it's okay to depend on the implementation? Well, again, okay and not okay are not quite the right way to think about this. Um, string. I don't want an interface on top of string. I just want to use string. <laughs> and why? Yeah. Because string's not going to change. The guys who wrote string are not going to reach in and change string for the reason that you mentioned earlier. They'd have hell to pay. Every programmer in the world would rise up in righteous indignation and, and fly to their office and, and descend upon them with clubs. So it's probably not worth worrying about string. Then you get into the, the stuff that you are currently writing, the volatile stuff, the stuff that is changing a lot. And you'd like to have some kind of insulation layer to protect you against that change. And there's no better insulation layer than a bunch of interfaces. That really helps a great deal because it takes the dependency mm -hmm. and turns it backwards. You can write the high level stuff and the high level stuff can be independent of the low level stuff, which allows you to reach into the low level stuff and make changes to it without worrying about the high level stuff. That's what that principle is really all about. It's about drawing this line and then making sure that all source code dependencies pr cross that line, pointing towards the higher level stuff so that the higher level stuff is not polluted by detail. Now, if you're writing a utility and that utility is a one of a kind, it's going to do one thing. It's never going to have any kind of changes in your estimation. You have to put an interface in front of it. No, you might find out later that, well, oh, gee, I wish I'd put an interface in front of this, but okay. You're going to make mistakes like that and you will pay for them. But you can't protect yourself from everything. So you have to draw the line and say, okay, across this line, I'm going to put interfaces in here. And it's a reasonable thing yeah. to do. And on the other side of the line, well, I don't need to do that. <laughs> Sounds good. And the volatility expect. Uh, aspect of it is really crucial here, right? Like you have to understand the context, like what you're doing and how often it's going to change or how often you're going to add new implementations. And again, you, after knowing all of that, you will be wrong. You might be there say that, okay, I might have depended on an interface. That's all fine because that's the complexity of software engineering, right? You, you don't know everything. Uh, that sounds all good. I want to focus a little bit on the testing part. Uh, so I know I, I also like doing TDD, right? Again, that is one such thing, uh, which, uh, which proves that naming is hard, uh, because test driven development, people think that, oh, I have to write tests before write the actual code, but that's just a part of it, right? That's the, let's say a side effect of it. What do you have to say to that? Well, there's so many things to say about this. Um, um. It's a beautiful discipline. It is a really lovely discipline. Um, and it is yeah. done in the tiniest of little cycles. 
what a lot of detractors don't understand is just how small those cycles are. Other detractors hate the smallness of the cycles, but that's another matter, right? So you let you write a tiny yeah. little bit of test code, not the whole test, and then it doesn't compile. So you write enough code to make it compile, and now it compiles, and you write a little more code in the test, and it doesn't pass, and you write a little code, and it makes it pass, and you go, oh, it passed. And then you write a little more test, and a little more code, and you're going around that cycle like every five seconds, right? It's really tight. Um, and that's the real essence of it, that tight little cycle. It's a tight feedback loop, right? The tighter you can get the yeah. feedback loop, the less mistakes you're going to make, the less you're going to oscillate, right? It's a control theory 101. Tight feedback loops prevent bad oscillations, right? So we're going to spin around that loop a lot. Now, a lot of people don't like that because they think, well, it's boring, it's tedious, it's horrible. Oh, my God, I, I won't even be able to finish a, a single function or even a single if statement, whatever. Okay, you're right. Yeah, but you can you after a while you really start depending on that little loop. You can't do it everywhere. There's a lot of places where test driven development just doesn't work properly. And they're very well defined cases, right? Wherever you are close to the boundary of the machine and you're producing values that are going to leave the machine, it's very difficult to test that. Right? It, it, the 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 code that sets the pixels on the GUI. It's really difficult to test that if you don't have a camera. And who's going to set up a camera and then look at that? You're not going to write that test, right? The code that spits the bits down the socket. You're not going to test that. Right? So there's there are there's stuff you cannot test. You can't write it for everything. I I just got. I'm in the middle of, and I just finished a release of a fairly large application. Uh, which is a client for a social network that I like called Noster. And um, there's a lot of GUI involved, a lot of processing involved. And I think the number of tests is on the order of 80%. The GUI stuff, I can't test it. I can't test it. I can test it with my eyes. And I try to pull out all the testable bits of it. But there's a whole bunch of junk in there. I just plain cannot test reasonably. So, okay, I'll write the code and it deals with the GUI and I just have to let that be untested and it bothers me and it scares me because sometimes I have to refactor that and that it's at risk, but I can't write the test for that. On the other hand, I've got a whole bunch mm. of stuff that I have written tests for and I'm really glad those tests are there because they've saved my bacon a million times. Right? So it's all, again, it's all engineering, right? You've got stuff that you do yep. that you can test and there's stuff that you can't boy when you can it's a huge benefit totally i personally i felt that again tdd can be tedious if you are not uh, used to it but it at least removes the, the cognitive overload from my mind i have to think incrementally and i don't have to think about the entire algorithm at once and end ending up making mistakes some silly mistakes but if you have TDD, you get tests along with it and you think incremental. There is more chances that you would end up producing a valuable code and not having uh, bugs. Um, one of the problems with test-driven development is a, um, a human problem. If you are a test-driven developer, you want everyone on your team to be a test-driven developer because if they aren't, they ruin everything you've done. They will write code without tests that will ruin all the benefit you thought you were get. So it's, it is a very unstable situation to have a team where some of the people do test-driven development and some do not. And that has to get resolved. You know, put the people who don't want to do tests in a different team. <laughs> put the people who do want to do tests into their own team because otherwise um, it's going to be a, a personnel nightmare. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's true with uh, even pair programming, right? Like I want to do yeah. pair programming, but the other person doesn't want to or doesn't like, so it's not going to work. Similar to clean code, right? I, if I like the clean code principles, other person don't like it or don't have time to follow it for whatever reason, then it's not going to work. It's a team effort at the end because at the end you're writing software within team to create some business value, right? So you have to see either you are able to advocate to what is working for you and why this is the better thing to do. Or you just say, okay, my team doesn't follow clean code, so 
I'll just follow some best practices and get done with it, right? So there's, again, people problems are everywhere. That's so true. <laughs> um, since we're talking about testing, right? Uh, I have used mocking and mocks and libraries like Mockito and so many times. And it, it has given me fast uh, execution or development time because I can write quickly without depending on external um, libraries or services. It's great. But sometimes, and there's this argument that mocking, and I understand because it may diverge from the actual service behavior, right? You might mock it incorrectly or differently, or you might not be able to update the mocking, and it might result in not so effective testing. Uh, And there are thoughts about using test containers or using stubs or some other things. Uh, What what are your thoughts on that and your experience uh, with mocking as a as a framework for testing. Ooh, there's a bunch of things to say about that. Um, first of all, I'm in the school of thought that says the fewer mocks you can use, the better. Um, I want to test my functions and what they return. Um, so I try to avoid using any kind of test doubles, any kind of mocks or stubs or anything like that um, across simple functions. Now, when you get into collaborations, there are times when you need to stub out the collaborators. And I, my next um, strategy is to use the simplest kind of mock I can. I don't want to even use a mock. I'll use a stub. Just a real simple, stupid stub. And I'll try that as much as I can. There are times when you are reaching across a fairly large gulf. And... You can't just depend on a stub. You have to depend upon a spy or a mock or something that is a little more complicated. And I try to push those across architectural boundaries. That's one of the ways I know that I've got an architectural boundary is that I need a spy on the other side of it. Right. So I'll try to separate it that way. Now, that is that is a school of thought that has become known as the Chicago School for some reason. There's another school of thought, which is called the London School, which says, no, put put mocks everywhere. Spy, stub, spy, just spy on everything. And I'm exaggerating for effect here. But the that school of thought says it's just a great idea to use mocks everywhere. Just use them. And uh, both of these schools of thought have advantages to them. Right? So I'm not saying one's right, one's wrong. My preference is the Chicago style, right? Nice, minimal, hardly any, and then only use them where I must. And if I've got a mock or a spy, I can build an architectural boundary. Um, The other thing is that I try not to use mocking frameworks. Mockito, Jmock, EasyMock, MOQ. I, I try not to use them because if you are minimally stubbing, (laughs) it's really easy to write your own. Most of the IDEs will implement an interface for you. So you click on the interface, you go to a menu item, you say implement, and it gives you a dummy. It gives you a degenerately implemented version of the interface. And then you can reach in and call it a stub. Reach in and return some value that makes it a stub. And at that point, you can name it. You can put it in a directory. It becomes part of your source code. It's not something that you are building on the fly with lots of dots and parentheses up in the setup of your test. It's just something that you can create in your test and pass it in. I much prefer that approach. So usually I don't use those frameworks. (laughs) Okay. That that makes sense. Um, And again, I've seen really extreme approaches here. Like people spying on log statements <laughs> or uh, verifying that the log message is correct and it is printing all the necessary IDs. Uh, I was thinking about this and in most cases, I wouldn't go that far. But in cases, let's say you want to really not print that log or something or really want that log to be printed, maybe it's okay. Uh, again, using of mocks, test containers, all contextual, depending on what your team already using. Uh, most cases, people join teams that already have certain yes. thought process, right? Certain frameworks that they use and you have to use it. But again, I think it boils down to reducing the side effects. So you ha- create these uh, pure functions that you can easy, uh, easily test without using mocks or stubbing. 
But then there are cases when you have no choice yep. but to have side effects in that go with whatever approach you like, right? So that's the recommendation. Awesome. Second last question <laughs> before we end this amazing session. So uh, let's imagine that the world is ending, right? And uh, someone asks you like, Uncle Bob, just tell me three principles uh, when it comes to clean code, clean architecture, whatever, you take it, right? What would be those three principles you would like the world to know and to follow uh, before <laughs> the world ends? Or the world ends. Yeah, I'd like to find something that would prevent the world from ending. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I know what you're trying to say here. So if you can if boil all these things down, right? Boil everything down, boil clean architecture and clean code and solid principles. Boil everything down. What yeah. is the essence at the bottom? Software is a discipline. We don't learn this early. We, we learn this late. Um, mostly because we make so many mistakes that we realize that some discipline must be imposed. And, and eventually we learn that this thing that we do, this writing of code, is a discipline in and of itself. It is a discipline. And a discipline is driven by a number of things. It's driven by um, um, rituals that are difficult to explain. Like test-driven development, that is a difficult ritual to explain. Makes perfect sense if you get used to it. But as a, yeah. try and explain it to someone, I think, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. So discipline is driven by ritual. It's driven by ethics. And it's driven by standards. Those are the three things. Boil things down to three things. Disciplines, ethics, and standards. And we, as a profession, and I use that word loosely, do not know what our ethics and our standards and our disciplines are. We have not defined them. And therefore, it's very difficult to call ourselves a profession because there is nothing that we profess. We haven't learned that yet. Now, it's a very young industry. You know, the first code was written 75 years ago. So, so it's, we've got time. Well, <laughs> like you're saying, the world's about to end. I hope we have the time to boil our behavior down and identify what these ethics are, what the standards are, what the disciplines are. It's easy for me to say a few of them that I hope are part of our disciplines. I think we should have a testing discipline. Is it test-driven development? I don't know. I like that. But I think we should have a testing discipline. We should all have a testing discipline of some kind. And it's got to be better than, oh, I sometimes write a couple of unit tests. It's got to be a little better than that. <laughs> there are some standards that we should have. One of those standards is that every bit of code that can be tested is tested somehow. And, and again, I'm not going to go into, well, test over development would guarantee that. I don't know. But that's a standard, a, like something like that. And then ethics. What are the ethics? And one of the ethics has got to be that, that we programmers protect our businesses from themselves. Because if we let the business drive unrestrained, they will drive the code into the ground. We are the only ones who know how to keep that code from getting driven into the ground. And therefore, we must protect that somehow. Otherwise, the business will fail. And I've watched companies fail because their code has been driven into the ground. It happens a lot, it's especially in startups. One of the reasons startups tend to fail so much is because they drive the code into the ground and they cannot react anymore. So those are some of the things that we have to get our arms around. And I just talked about the bare minimum. There has to be a lot more on the ethics side, on the standard side, on the discipline side, that we are just barely starting to, to understand. Great points. Uh, and I totally agree. I mean, it comes with practice. I mean, you can create some rituals, but if you don't do any enough practice, you will get bored. You won't follow them. Uh, I think it boils down to following a discipline with consistency and uh, evolving that 
with time because you will learn new things that, oh, this discipline does not have these great things. Let's incorporate those as well. So I think uh, that makes sense. Uh, last question that uh, our viewers would be most interested in. What are some resources that you would suggest uh, folks to read? Like apart from your books, of course, I think uh, your books are pretty common and people have read it or at least referred for some uh, or the other concepts. But what are some other books that are not that well known and people should actually spend some time reading that? So or um, watching? Kent Beck just wrote a lovely little book just just recently, just out now. And, it, and it's called... Um, Tiny First. <laughs> Yes, thank tidy you. Tidy first. <laughs> tidy first. I keep getting confused with tidy yeah. whities. No, tidy first. Uh, <laughs> wonderful book. It's a real fast read. Uh, and it's just full of a lot of wisdom. So that's a great book. It's brand new, so people probably haven't heard of it. Um, going back in time. Everyone should have design patterns. Everyone should have read design patterns. And anybody, and, and don't believe the silliness on the web that says design patterns are archaic and no one follows them anymore. That's complete nonsense. Um, so the design patterns book is something everybody should just have on their bookshelf and know it pretty well. Um, Martin, Martin Fowler's refactoring book is a gold mine. I, can't, I cannot recommend that one enough. But there's another book that Martin wrote before that almost nobody knows about. And it's wonderful. It's, and, it's, and the name of it is Analysis Patterns. And it's a high-level look at the data structures and behaviors that apply to business in general. Just really nice stuff in there. So there's a book that would be very beneficial uh, for folks to read. Going back even further in time, things get more valuable as you go back in time, right? This is something that young programmers come out of school and they look at a book that's 40 years old. They say, well, why would I read a book that's 40 years old? You really want to read those books because that was the moment that people were figuring out the basics and articulating the basics. So there's a wonderful book uh, written by Tom DeMarco years and years ago, Structured Systems what is it called? Structured System Analysis, right? Yeah, Structured Analysis and System Specification. Beautiful book. Wonderful book. And don't freak out about the diagramming notation he uses and all that stuff. The book is spectacular. There's a number of books like that are good. Any of the of Knuth's books, right? Go get Fundamental Algorithms, Sorting and Searching, Semi-Numerical Algorithms, just read those and, and don't worry about the goofy code he's got in there. Just, nobody cares about this mix assembler that he wrote a long time ago. But it's beautiful stuff. Mm. Wonderful stuff. Um, here's a book that everybody should read. And it's free. You can get this book online. <laughs> the PDF is online. What is it? It's Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. Uh, there is so much good stuff in this book. And it, it's kind of hard to understand, hard to articulate why this is such a wonderful book to read. So, yeah, I would certainly take that uh, as something. To, uh, I think you can do a Google search and find the PDF. And by the way, there's a bunch yeah. of videos of the authors in the 1980s <laughs> lecturing mm -hmm. on there. And they're at chalkboards writing code on the chalkboard. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful to watch. Anyway, there's a couple for you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I have hundreds of more questions to ask, but unfortunately, the time is limited. And uh, so thank you for joining me today. Um, and I'm sure our viewers are going to get a lot of value, at least more clarity on following these principles and what these mean. Um, and there's always context attached to it. So thanks again for sharing those resources, My sharing pleasure. those insights. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And for our viewers, if you like this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more such videos.